Hello everyone and welcome to this ThingLink webinar live again. Remember, remember, 5th of November um, and we've got some great crackers for you. <laughs> so I see that we've got lots of people joining us already. We've had 500 people or so join up and it's really great to see so many of you and we've got a cracking lineup for you. Um, some uh, just Put that sound off. So yeah, we've got people joining us who are just real innovators in higher education and we can't wait to show you their examples. So I'm just going to share my screen with you now and uh, just have some nice title slides to go through. So um, on the team tonight that's joining us, I am delighted to say we have Kyla joining us and Kyla is um, working with the ThingLink team and she has a specialism in culture and heritage. So Kyla's been doing some great work with museums and understanding the ways that museums and galleries have been using ThingLink. Um, of course, there's myself that you probably all know now. Um, I head up education and community for ThingLink. Um, but most of all, uh, the important people, we have Dr. Abalasha Jones from the University of Central Lancashire. And Abby specializes in education across disciplinaries. And we also have Sarah Fielding from the University of Southampton. And Dr. Sarah um, has been someone that I've been following for quite some time. Time we met actually what well, feels like a lifetime ago but it was only last year at the Association for Learning Technology Conference and uh, Sarah really opened my eyes to all of the work she was doing with ThingLink. So a little agenda for you we have our usual hour although it seems to fly by um, I'm just going to show you a little bit background and ThingLink and what's been happening in Finland. That's just some interesting pointers there. Um, over then to our higher education innovators. Kyla's going to give us a little bit of a taster about some of the work in Hungary that we've been involved in, which is a ThingLink social impact project in partnership with the museums. And then there are some really nice updates. And we always like to give you a little teaser and a taste of some of the updates that are coming to ThingLink. Don't forget, you can ask us any questions, pop them into the chat, and we'll put them on the screen as well. So for those of you who are new to ThingLink, um, it's really lovely to have seen this year I, when I joined ThingLink a year ago, the examples were good already, but this year they've just been outstanding. And, you know, we can't ever think about um, anything positive really about the current situation with COVID, but it has actually um, encouraged people to use digital media. And we are seeing people have to really demonstrate their skills and being creative. And what we've seen is ThingLink being used in new ways, um, and that's been really inspiring to us. So ThingLink, if, and I'll share these slides at the end, you're welcome to use them. There's a little video there. You can create campus tours and courses and share those out with your learners. But what I've highlighted here, um, and you'll see this with um, Abby's example, is that more than ever before, we need to have materials that engage learners wherever they are, but they need to be in context and they need to be in context for today because we're living in a very different world. So the models that are depicted in the, in the scenarios that we're using, are they diverse? Are they representative of the cultures that we need to ensure are representative? And we also want to make sure they're culturally relevant. So using technologies which are relevant so we've counted up 350 million learners a year are now accessing ThingLink. So, um, yeah, it has grown um, pretty exponentially this year. And Ulla and the team. So ThingLink is founded in Finland. Um, Ulla Koivala, whose brainchild it was, um, is in Finland right now. And they've done some research and looked at how 
Thinglink is being used in Finland and they found that 50% now of all of the Finnish TVET organizations and TVET stands for Technology Vocational Education Training. Um, it's actually a global term that's used. It may not be used that much in the UK, but it's the term for that kind of e-learning workspace training um, and uh, college education, for example. And 50% of the Finnish organizations are using ThingLink. And what they've been mostly using it for, the top four use cases, are making physical learning environments accessible from anywhere, so field trips, working with other businesses so that you can actually get um, learning environments in context because people can't go out and vid video or go out on field trips or explore places which they might have been able to do before, but even now, um, even if they can go and visit, there are still places which are really inaccessible. Um, we're seeing a big increase uptick in students using ThingLink to actually demonstrate their learning. So being given a blank image and then putting in their own hotspots and then showing their own learning. Um, embedding interactive content into LMS systems. So we've widened our reach with the LMS systems that we're engaging with. And we're seeing a big uptick in um, professional development for staff internally as well. And that, that picture on the right is a health and safety course, which is used in onboarding, which every teacher has to see before they join the college. So some really nice examples there. Um, so how can you use it? What media can you use? And this is another thing that's worth remembering that when you upload your images to ThingLink, you get your account page. But images can be anything. We've seen choice boards this year. We've seen people using screenshots and tagging screenshots to explain things. We've also seen students using a lot more videos as well and images to, this is a student demonstrating a biography of the wonderful David Attenborough. But we've also uplifted our uh, limit for videos so you can upload a 10 gigabyte video now. And this is um, the, the head teacher from Sterling, Mr. Cassidy, and he's doing this wonderful introduction to his school. Um, and this means they don't have to use YouTube, but it also is a segue into other thing links as well, which is a tour of the school. And this teacher's used a video, and I like this one, I popped this in there. It's only a little gift, so you can see, but she's created this video and she has put the hotspots in afterwards and you can put your hotspots into your thing link video but she actually then points to them and it's like you know the kind of tag pops up it looks like a bit of um trickery there but it just makes it really engaging and i think that's a really nice way of using it and then of course you've got your 360 so using 360 images for tours and of course you can switch out the 360 if you need to as well so if a classroom changes you don't need to lose all your tags you can just switch out the 360 but then also 360 videos so uh, these are all the types of base media you can use and that just shows the the versatility of ThingLink and all the different ways in which you can use it and before we move on to our featured higher education innovators. I just wanted to highlight this one. You might have seen this if you've watched a few of our webinars, but we've really seen this year people uh, creating their custom icons. It's bringing um, some really nice use cases. And this is Croydon High Street, which has been developed as a 360. It works on goggles as well. And they've used the icons to create um, hand washing stations, sanitizers, and also where you have to wear your face masks. And, and this has been done for the whole of Croydon. And it's those colored icons which are, are really making a difference, you know, the ability to create those. So that's probably enough from me, but I hope that's given you a flavor. If you haven't used ThingLink before, um, of some of the things you can do for it. But I'm just now going to um, uh, bring in, and I'm delighted to um, introduce Abby Jones. Abby, congratulations on all of the work that you've been doing. It's just fantastic. And I'm so 
proud to, to share what you've been doing. So it'd be lovely to hear more about how you developed it, the context. Sure, thank you so much, Louise, and thank you for having me. Um, I'm so surprised about how people have really enjoyed to see what we've made. I mean, I was really excited to make it and to, and to develop it for our students. Um, but it's been lovely to hear people really um, liking what we've created and, and being fas fascinated to move on and use Thing Link in their own way, in their own education. Regarding what we created, so this started, I, so I'm um, the lead for, um, um, I'm the clinical lead for interprofessional education at the School of Medicine and the University of Central Lancashire. And so my role is to um, educate our medical students about uh, the multidisciplinary team that they will be working with in, in real life. And, um, and by learning about others, we know for a fact that if you know who is in your team and what they do and the role they have, then patient care is better. And that's what everything is about. Um, one of the um, hot topics in medicine at the moment is frailty and with an aging population we have um, a lot of patients who um, are struggling with this and can actually have quite poor outcomes. So we knew this was a great topic to talk about and we know it's a really good topic to talk about interprofessionally because we're all um, as health professionals um, seeing patients with frailty. So um, I'm very lucky to work in the School of Medicine um, at UCLan because we have loads of um, uh, disciplines there. And um, seven of us got together. So we had um, pharmacy, um, occupational therapy, physiotherapy, um, physicians associates, social work, paramedics. Um, we all got together um, and we said we'd really like to do something for frailty working together. And we had decided, oh, we're gonna get our students together and we're gonna talk about a patient case and then COVID hit. And just like that, working, well, having 350 students coming together was not an option. Um, and so we're like, well, can we do this online? So we thought we have Microsoft Teams, let's, let's give it a go. But I was like, how do I get my patient story out? How do I show my students what I want them to see about a patient? So I created a story about um, a lady um, so it was a, it was a it was 88 year old black lady who I'd, who I'd actually met in real real life, but all names and such a change. Um, Florence Williamson, who um, really wanted to stay at home. She didn't want people messing with her, but she'd normally been looked after by her family. And uh, but COVID had prevented that from happening. And I wanted the pet, wanted our students to hear this story, but to see it as well. And a colleague of mine said, oh, well, why don't you think, why don't you use ThingLink? This might work. And I was like, what on earth is ThingLink? And she showed me and literally it was like a light bulb moment. I thought, I can do this. This will make a huge difference. I can embed all the information we need to give in one picture. It'll be in one space. They won't be going through this PDF and that Word document or anything like that. They'll be able to access everything they need. So I thought, right, I need to get a picture. Um, but lo and behold, the picture I wanted didn't exist. Um, and especially with things like the Black Lives Matter movement, it mattered to me that this lady um, was represented. So I was like, right, I'm gonna make my own picture. So luckily we have um, this room in, the, um, in our department. And thankfully with the clinical skills team, um, they helped me put, put this scenario together. And I thought, actually, I can even put more, more information into this picture than just, just embedding my, my hotspots. So you'll see things like she's on the sofa with a duvet. Why is that? You know, well, that's because she's sleeping on the sofa and she can't make it to her bed. She's got a biscuit tin there that's empty. Why is that? Well, actually, it's because she's just eating snacks. She's not eating proper food. There's a bag of shopping and as the bag that's full of stuff that's not been touched. Um, you know, there's, there's a, a coffee table that's full of just bits of things, including a medication. And one of the things we have to, um, get our students to think about and in health is to think around your patient you know everything is a clue so look at your patient don't just listen to what they've got to say what's around you and i could use this image to try and build that skill because that's a difficult skill to learn we tell them to look but can you actually do it um, and so actually our students were really able to explore this image um, or when we did our frailty simulation day and pick up this new information that we put in. Oh, when I talk about new information, so when I made this image, what I also did is that we, we cloned it. So we cloned it five times and we embedded information 
that only students of a certain discipline would normally have. So if you imagine Florence as a patient, as a GP, which is my background, I would only have information about her that's in my GP record. So if I wanted to know about her, that's it. That's all I have. If I am a social worker, I'll only have information that's really relating to social work that's in their record. And, and a lot of people are always surprised to hear that healthcare records don't actually live together. They're all sort of separate. And again, the physiotherapy students, uh, they would only have information that's to, to physiotherapy. So what we did, we cloned it and we gave information that's about that patient to each discipline. So when they actually came together on the day and they had this one, which had all the other little bits, they had information that only they had read. And so they had what well, part of that um, task was to figure out that one, I've only got information that no one has and I need to share this with the group. And um, they were able to share it, look at the new things that were given. So one of the new things that was given was we have um, uh, some audio and that's um, a telephone consultation between the GP and the paramedic. And that kind of goes through some of the issues that are happening with the patient and helps to give these clues to our students about what they need to be thinking about with their management plan. So there's lots of different information that we have to all bring together to create a management plan that's going to be best for this patient. And that is a skill in medicine and in health. And it's really difficult to replicate. Um, but ThingLink allowed us to do that, actually, and do I think do it really well. And um, it was really lovely to embed things that you wouldn't normally get to, to share with the students. So we've got, done a picture of her medication. And some of the medication is hers, and some of it's her um, late husband, and some of it's a neighbour. And it's actually giving up clues that your patient's taking stuff they probably shouldn't be. You need to be doing something about that, as well as just doing their normal prescriptions and things. So... Um, it really allowed us to give us real depth to the information that we were giving our students and they really enjoyed it. They really enjoyed using it. Um, we had um, we we got feedback from at least, I think, what, about 169 of them. Um, and 80 percent felt that, you know, on this way of online learning was a really good method of learning interprofessionally. And um, and they really liked using the thing link. So we were really happy about it. So I just ran. Oh. <laughs> Right, <laughs> that's amazing. I and if people are watching, um, we've developed this into a case study because we were so impressed with it. And uh, Kyla has actually put the case study together, and we're just getting the final kind of thumbs up to make sure it's okay. But what we can do is to make sure that everybody that's watching gets a link to that case study because it's it's the detail. And and you know when you look at um, research about successful pieces of engaging content like this it's the attention to detail and, and the context that matters and I think you've absolutely cracked it I think it's just fantastic thank so thank you so much for sharing that with us and you've had a lot of love on the YouTube chat as well some people are really saying that this is just the most incredible thing link um, yeah, everyone's really really impressed so do have a look at the YouTube um, and uh, you're going to be joining us at the end so if anyone's got any questions um, you'll be hanging around and uh, we can ask them but thanks ever so much Abby just absolutely love that uh, it's just uh, yeah, absolutely fantastic. So um, thank you. I'm just going to now, we're going to introduce our other um, featured educator, Sarah Fielding. Dr. Sarah, hello. How are you? <laughs> hello. Um, thank you very much for having me. Um, oh, it's just great to see that last example as well but i know that you've got your example too it's just been amazing to see what you've been doing and we actually met all those months ago which seems like a whole lifetime at the association for learning technology where i was just yeah. blown away you were hands-on didn't you using thing links in your seminar yes yeah i did um i think abby's uh, probably a tough act to follow that sparked off loads of ideas now for me to take away so it's it's lovely to see that and it's lovely to see such a, a wide-ranging audience uh probably just here and, and on youtube later um yeah i'm going to take a different approach for the presentation and just dive into to a tour um what yeah I'm go ahead and show your screen and then i can pop it yeah. in the screen um so it it's really the, uh, to share, um, let's make sure I get the right one. There we go. Um, so 
I hope uh, I'll cue that up. Yeah, that's um, good. But by way of a bit of background, um, so I work in a central services department with teams of academics. So this is a project that we worked on with Ocean and Earth Sciences at the University of Southampton. And it's for a um, second year marine biology cohort of about 80 plus students. And this isn't actually the um, the south coast of England. This is South Wales that the, the students go to. And um, there's four main locations in the tour. And it's one of my favourite ones because it's, it's we got great weather when we were collecting the media and it just maps together really nicely. Um, so there's Dale Fort, which is where the students stay because it's a week long residential. And we have 80 plus students. You can imagine there are some students with disclosed um, additional learning needs, some students who've preferred not to do that. And this was really a way, um, I'm gonna head into the fort to show you some of these things, but really a way to help the students um, kind of understand what their surroundings were going to be like. Um, I'm hoping my connection is okay because I've got a spinning wheel. Here we go. So we're now into the, the courtyard of the fort. They've got accommodation blocks. Um, they've got labs where they do practical classes and common rooms. There's a staff room where they can find staff to help them out. And we pop in various bits of health and safety information like they have to sign in and sign out when they leave the fort because it's quite a remote location and we want to keep hold of um, just understanding where everybody is and um, for students who have um, particular dietary requirements for example we've captured things like the canteen but also the sandwich room to make it really clear to them um, where they'll be able to eat to hopefully reduce their anxiety a little bit and to make it really clear. Um, let's wait for this to catch up. Um, so students who have um, particular dietary requirements, they can see how that's all managed. Um, we've got special areas over here for um, gluten free diets and things like that. Uh, we give them a few instructions about how they might want to access that at certain times of the morning because it gets very, very busy with 80 students. This was obviously pre-COVID. Um, but one of the things that I really like about this trip is that we've tried to map um, the pedagogy of the field trip onto the virtual tour. And what I mean by that is for the first few days, they spend um, the first few days basically learning to identify different species. And then the second half of the residential is an independent study project. So what we've done is use the two locations here, uh, Westdale and East, uh, East Gan. We've used that because when they do their sampling at the beginning of the week, that happens at Gan. So in the tour, in these locations, we've got a, a mud flat and a rocky shore here. And I kept thinking when we were doing this, I had the best job in the world we had great weather we were out doing field work we were just capturing all sorts of fantastic things with the students and with the staff and just the images are quite striking themselves um, we did try and contrive a few things by putting uh, groups together but sometimes you just have to wing it to a certain extent with um, these kinds of thing link images but we've embedded a lot of um, media that we shot on site so this is we took a, at least two media developers on the field trip and did professional level filming so the students can actually watch all of these videos and know what the main species are that they have to identify and then in the other location uh, which i will just head back to quickly because it really is beautiful so in uh, Westdale, uh, which is more of an exposed shore, we've put the videos for the students doing their um, independent study projects. And we've packaged up all those videos and we've left them here in this location. So the students know that in on the first few days, they know that they will be doing 
species identification in GAN. And then they've got the option of moving between the two sites to do their, their project work. And we've included um, various bits of health and safety information that are quite clearly coded up. Um, and we've tried to be consistent with those tags all the way through. And so that's back to there. And the final location that is in the tour, um, which isn't um, parts of the, the fort that are linked together, is Scomer Island. And they do one day um, just as a general interest trip out into the field. And the thing is with Scomer Island, it's it's literally just the island. So um, in terms of managing their expectations about what they have to bring and what um, facilities they will have access to, this really does get across to them um, what they can be expecting for the day. And you can actually see in shot, there is one of our media developers who was doing the filming at the time. And the camera is just perched, just perched here. Um, so it's been a really, really lovely thing to put together. Um, it's one of our more um, concise tours. We did another one for the south of Spain for ecology students, and that's it's a much bigger, bigger tour. But this one has, has come together really nicely, I think. And we've got a good mix of the, um, uh, the video materials in there. What I didn't show you was the library at the fort, and we've used that to link to a lot of the literature that's basic reading for the course. So we've tried to kind of put them in the right place-based settings for the activities that they'll be doing. And it's worked out really nicely. I may have rattled through that rather quickly, Louise. <laughs> oh, that was just amazing. Uh, just loads of really nice questions that I don't want to um, gloss over and answer at the end, but people were saying, you know, this looks and feels so much better than just having a list of videos and highlighting that it's providing that great context that we talked about. And, you know, you must have had some nice feedback. Um, what's generally been the kind of response from students who are maybe learning and, and seeing this kind of content for the first time, and they might have only been used to kind of lists on a playlist or something. Yeah, we've. Um, I did actually embed a feedback form into the tour. Um, this year has been obviously particularly difficult um, in terms of getting feedback and actually uh, doing any field, field work. Um, we made a point of talking to the students about what we were doing when we were there um, and engaging them with the kind of information that they wanted to know about because they've usually had a, a kind of a sort of document of joining instructions for the field trip and pre-reading that they had to do. Um, one of the things that I really, really liked about this is quite a lot of it was built on location. Um, day or four is quite remote and Wi-Fi tends to just disappear when you've got 80 students <laughs> doing something all together. Um, but when I could find the quiet times, this, you know, the footage was shot in a GoPro Fusion. Uh, we also used a 360 that would pair to my phone and I did have points where I was just pushing it from the phone into the ThingLink interface and being able to add tags to it almost as a draft um, kind of thing. So it, it's just really quick and really easy to use. And what I say to the academics that I work with is I'm actually not that much of a technically minded person, um, although I'm, I'm a manager of a digital learning team. Um, so <laughs> something that I can pick up and use quite easily, then there's absolutely no problem why they, they shouldn't be able to do this. Um, so this was really built as a, a kind of a proof of concept to show what could be done. And what we're hoping to do is at some point, um, once we've got COVID out of the way, is open up more conversations about how else we could use it. Yeah, that's brilliant. And a couple of other things David was asking. Yeah, you can use 360 images, you can use videos um, and upload those as your base media or put them in the tags as well. And uh, a little bit of feedback there from our wonderful Amanda. I'm sure you've seen some of Amanda's examples. We do share them quite often and she's saying that she could adapt that for the little ones as well. I think, you know, if you are going to go on a, a tour, whether it's a virtual trip or whether it's a, a real study trip in the future, why wouldn't you want to do that kind of preparation for your students to make them feel more comfortable? Because OK, it's, it's quite good to kind of feel outside your comfort zone and go and find where you're going to have your lunch or whatever. But for some students, that's just going to detract from the learning. So to have all that, yeah, yeah 
that's absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much for being with us and sharing this. And we're going to make this into a video as well. So Kylie is going to be in touch and um, then we'll be able to share that out. But thanks ever so much, Sarah. And you'll stay with us in a QA and a panel as well at the end, won't you? Yeah. So yeah. Yeah, some great examples there. Um, I'm just going to share my screen again and go back to my presentation because what I do have now is... Um, I have uh, the little intro to um, what we've been doing in Hungary. And some of you have um, seen this. We've been putting this out on Twitter and Facebook and on our LinkedIn page. But we were approached by, um, it was Ula who originally took the call from uh, two incredible Anna and Anna um, in Budapest who we just wanted to find a way of encouraging collaboration and bringing museums together at a time which was going to be really difficult with COVID and wanted to see if there was a way in which schools and students could actually contribute to create virtual tours of some of the museums. But that sounds pretty kind of standard but that was just the initial thinking and with support from Ula um, they've just taken it to a whole new level and it's my real pleasure to introduce Kyla into the um, oh hang on a sec um, the, introduce Kyla onto our webinar hello Kyla and um, hi hi everyone um, can you, you hear me okay yeah, we can hear you loud and clear. So you actually then um, took the baton over to go and meet with Anna and Anna, and uh, we'd love to hear more about what you found. And I know that you put this into a case study as well, and you can share it out with everyone. So over yeah, to you exactly. to hear more. So um, as Louise mentioned, we'll be able to share this case study with you after the webinar. So some of you may have seen it, some of you won't, but it's a really interesting example. And uh, funnily enough, we've already had a question from, I think it was Moira. Moira, hi, thank you for joining us, asking about um, if students could collaborate on an artifact together. And I think you'll find that this is very much an example of where that happened, because this is a case study all about collaboration. And I was really honored to um, to be part of this case study and put it together because it was incredible what these ladies managed to achieve in quite a short time. Um, so basically in Hungary, they have a, um, a day where they celebrate their national hero poet, Sandor, um, Sandor Petofi, after whom this museum uh, is named, this museum in their capital Budapest the Sandor Petofi Museum. And on that day, every year, they have literally thousands of students attending uh, schools visits. But because of COVID, obviously, this couldn't happen. So they had to think fast to think of a way that they could get all these students engaging in this amazing content that they have, these incredible artifacts in the museum. So Anna Cador came across ThingLink put together some fantastic content using ThingLink, put together a visual um, virtual tour. And then she thought to herself, but wait a second, we don't just have this one museum in Budapest, we've actually got six major national museums, archives, galleries and libraries who could all be using this um, same fantastic software to share what they have. And, um, hats off and all credit to Anna and her museum educators because it would have been very easy I think to go down the very obvious route of reproducing a 360 visual of each individual room and then just adding the content in but instead of that they did something really incredible which is they got all the six museums together virtually obviously during lockdown and instead they created a whole new schools tour. And it's quite extraordinary to think that they had never, ever before collaborated as six national museums in Hungary's capital. They'd never worked on a joint exhibition before. And these are really quite um, big name uh, museums. I'll just go through them for you. So we've got 
as well as the Literary Museum, we've got the um, Hungarian National Museum, the Hungarian National Gallery, the Museum of Fine Arts, the National Szczecini Library and the National Archives of Hungary. So these are big national museums who'd never collaborated before, but using ThingLink, they were able to create their own tours, virtual tours, divided into themes. And that was what I wanted to go back to um, the question about the collaboration, because yes, they were all able to collaborate on the same artifacts, but not divided into individual museums, divided into individual teams. So there's um, Maury's question coming up just there. So if I could just, um, if I can share my screen, Louise, if that's gonna be possible, I'd like to go into the, um, ooh, no. <laughs> No, that's not what I wanted to do. Um, if I go into the thing link. Are you able to see that, Louise? Yeah, that's all good. We can see that. Loud. Okay, brilliant. So this is um, this is the thing link that was created. And as you can see, I'm, I'm presuming that not everybody is fluent in Hungarian. So uh, down here, we've got the seven themes that the uh, six museums divided all their content into. Um, and down at the bottom, one of these themes, which I'm going to click on here, this was the future theme. So this was one of the rooms where they did have a 360 image. And one of the issues that they had, in fact, was that um, some of the museums already had 360 um, photography. Of, of the interiors of the museums. Others didn't. And in Budapest, when lockdown came, the museum educators were not able to go into the museums at all. They couldn't even go to work. So they had to work with what they had. So whereas, um, so I think this is the National Library in here, they were lucky enough to have a 360 image. But um, because they had divided uh, this virtual exhibition into themes, they decided that they would use this 360 as one of their base thing links, but then they were able to add in a huge variety of different kinds of artifacts and content. So for example, I love, I love this one because all the different museums came together and put their relevant content into this one room. So here you've got, I think from the Decorative Arts Museum, you've got a bangle. Um, and here you've got a little silver spoon. And here, if we click on, on that tag there, we've got some photography put into a, a video, some contemporary videography. So we've got all this different kind of content, including um, primary sources, cartoons and diaries, and all this content had never been put together before. Um, and it was only when ThingLink was being used that they realized the power of being able to link all these six different museums together which was incredibly powerful for them. And they really should be so proud of what they put together because within the first couple of months, they were able to produce virtual schools visits for 2000 school pupils, which when you think about what they were up against is really something quite formidable. And I'm, I'm so proud of what they did. It really is quite, um, quite a feat. And um, as Sarah said earlier, similar sort of situation a lot of these museum educators were not um you know technical whizzes they'd never used anything like this before and when i was researching this case study and i was speaking to anna she said to me the first thing link with the, that we created we put it together in an afternoon and we didn't have to use any we didn't go out outsource any um any designers, we did it all ourselves. And just talking to her, you could see that she was so proud of what they had been able to create. And I think it really showcases the power of ThingLink that people that, who don't have any prior experience of creating these sort of, um, these kind of tours with this kind of software can very quickly put it together. And another aspect that, um, that I'd like to draw out of this case study is similar to Abby's example, where she talked about the cloning um, of the, the base thing link. In this one, um, what's, what's really special about it is that this can be shared with all kinds of levels um, of education. So it can be used with K-12 students, it can be used in higher education. You can take these, um, these base thing links and change them and adapt them depending on um, the context and depending on the students that you are working with. Um, 
And the way that they used this, basically, this school's virtual tour, it was shared um, across a wide variety of platforms. So Anna told me that it was shared um, into the classrooms when schools went back. They were able to share this in the schools via Zoom, Microsoft Teams, Google Meet, Discord, Blackboard, Kahoot. So um, that was an, a really interesting part of it, that the teachers could all take their um, platform of choice and use ThingLink um, seamlessly with that. And the last thing that I would like to, to leave with you about this case study is the incredible way that they took this forward. The sort of what, what's next part of this case study is that they realised that, hey, hang on, this was really easy for us to put together this content as part of a, a virtual tour. So why don't we then get the children who we've presented this to to curate their own content? And I think these days we're all quite, used to children being content creators in lots of different ways. I mean, they're getting younger and younger. They can use smartphones better than we can, probably. But um, encouraging them to be content curators and to put together their own uh, exhibition and their own virtual tour is something really special. So that's what the museum educators are doing now. They're giving ThingLink to the pupils and they're encour encouraging them when they come in for their um, school's visits to put together their own tours with all this incredible different content and these artifacts that are so important and fundamental to um, their Hungarian history. So I hope you've enjoyed that. <laughs> That's amazing. I love you, the fact you got that point in. I was going to prompt that point. And the phrase that you used when you came off the call with Anna and Anna with me was that it was democratizing uh, cu curating skills and, you know, the ability for young people to develop those skills that they never get to use. And like, I just think that's fantastic. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. Angela's posed a question. I know we've got Q&A at the end, but I always think it's nice to bring the questions in. But you can actually um, look on the statistics for each of your thing links and see how many views it's had, which hotspots have been interacted with as well. So that's another really nice way to measure engagement. And for a lecturer um, using ThingLink, and I know that this is a higher ed focused webinar but I thought it was really important to share that example because mm. we've got a number of colleges that are collaborating together um, and students that are collaborating together and um, not only in Scotland but I've just been hearing today about an example in England um, and it's it's the point of it that you know you don't have to be in your silo you can collaborate across a department or departments or a campus but also yeah other businesses so using the experience that Sarah's had of working with another establishment or organization to develop those thing links together but also to work with industry and make places that are inaccessible make to make those accessible as well yeah. but to answer Angela's question yeah absolutely you've got those statistics and if people are logged in and they're using the question tag which is coming you will know that the um, statistics are relating to that particular person that's logged in as well so I just wanted to make sure we put those points in as well but Kyla thanks ever so much and you'll be coming back on at the end to our panel as yeah. well but again, lots and lots of really nice, um, again, there's some really nice comments that are coming through, really lovely um, feedback for all these examples. So thanks ever so much, Kyla, and we'll speak to you again in a moment. So yeah, just gonna put my screen back in and talk to you now a little bit about what's coming up. So. Um, I, I always think it's nice to showcase what else we've seen in the Twitter sphere or other ways in which people are using ThingLink. But sometimes I think we always see things online and we think, oh my goodness, you could ThingLink that up. And it went. <laughs> and I saw this um, on Twitter and I've posted it and I'll post the link in again. This is from a teacher who shares a lot of her content and I'm just so pleased that she does. And what she's done with this particular example is that at the end of her lesson, she created hangout breakout rooms so that students could choose to either go in a room and get some help with a teacher and there'll be a teacher in that hangout room or to go into a group room 
and then what I've done um, with this is to, to uh, uh, with permission to have used this image and then I've put my own hotspots in it where you could have the teacher doing an introduction saying this room is about so and so and then do a welcome and it's a social presence that you could bring with those additional kind of tags I just thought this was just so clever and creative and I mentioned this one as well I just thought that was quite funny to get the close-up of the the teacher that's doing teacher training and she's just pointing and then putting the tags in afterwards and of course you could change the background but that also answers another question that was in the chat which was can you use video absolutely you can use 360 images just plain normal images which could be you know a poster an infographic a photo or a video or a 360 image or a 360 video this is another example that we're going to be doing a case study of soon but um We've heard from both Dr. Abby and Dr. Sarah um, where they've created content, but don't forget that um, lots of universities and colleges are using these for campus tours. And we'll put the link in the chat for you to explore this on the University of Rochester's School of Medicine and Dentistry, because this is probably one of the most outstanding tours that we've seen in with, with using ThingLink and all of the hotspots are completely interactive. I'd love you to um, to uh, explore that. That's on their website as well. And it's got the videos of welcome from the Dean. They've actually got the same person that's uh, taking you on a tour around the School of Medicine and Dentistry. We've had quite a medical theme that's completely unintentional. <laughs> so, um, as always, we're, we're running close to the end of our time, but I just wanted to do a little bit of a, an update on some of our new and improved features. So we mentioned there um, the Replace the 360 backgrounds. That's been quite a key change. And remember that these changes are in response to your feedback. So do always give us feedback about improvements that you'd like to see. But we've improved our tour tags so that you get a little thumbnail and you can put a description of where they're going. Um, our language interface, Finnish, French, Spanish, Russian, Arabic, Korean and Italian. Um, we have got um, some new interface. I'm going to share those with you. And that brings um, a whole new bunch of features. But we've also got um, in tag video controls. And I'll put the link to this in the chat as well. But now, once you click on to your video, which might be embedded into a tag you can stop the video and pause the video and what you can do with that then is enable people to reflect and stop and pause the video so you know think about language learning so you'll be able to have that video that's in there as well so again something that's been added in complete response to your feedback so, Saima, this is the, one of the biggest changes of ThingLink in, in the last few years. You, you'll remember the new tag editor that came in um, just over a year ago. Uh, that's not going to change. The tag editor is going to stay exactly the same. Um, but what we are changing is our interface. And you might think, why Saima? Saima is one of the largest, it is actually the largest lake, most beautiful lake in Finland. And other organizations might have names of sweets, etc. We have Finnish lakes, um, being true to our Finnish heritage. Um, and Saima is our brand new interface. So on our website, you can go on to our blog post, which is explaining about SIMA, and you can sign up for our beta tester program. And what this will do will mean that you'll get that new login screen when you first log into ThingLink. So as you can see here, um, when I'm logging in with my account, it looks different. So it's a lot cleaner, it's more streamlined, and it's less cluttered. But what you'll be able to do, and I'm sure that Sarah will absolutely love this, is that you've got more control over your folders, but what you can also do is bulk upload 
um, your 360 images or your media directly into ThingLink and it will create a, um, a ThingLink of that media as soon as you upload it and you can do that to your folders. So it's going to take a lot of, um, of the pain out of uploading each image um, at the same uh, before that you would have done one after each other. You can do that all in one go. And I've tested it out and I could probably click on about 40 and upload about 40 or so. I haven't got more than 40 images to try, but you can see there that it worked really, really well. Um, for e-learning accounts, and this is a higher education webinar, so that's for our e-learning users, we're going to introduce native ThingLink forms. And you can see here, um, it's quite, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It's in its infancy at the moment, so we will be making it more sophisticated. But you will be able to embed your own questions into a tag um, and that will mean that that question form is for the person that's viewing it which means that you can bring assessments into your thing link um, and you'll know that it's that person that's completed it because it will be linked to their login details or embedded into the LMS page that they're accessing so yeah pineapple on a pizza yes no way I love pineapple on a pizza but I know many people don't but just to show you <laughs> how the forms work um, and we understand that people use LMS systems and we integrate with LMS systems, but sometimes people don't have an LMS system and they want to have a way that the person viewing the content isn't seeing a creator page. Um, so we created new interactive modules and we launched our first course this week in India which is where you can create interactive modules, which are obviously your series of thing links. Um, and that is a way to present your courses as well. So this is still in beta. We know it's not the polished article, but that's why we would just love your feedback so that you can try it and see how you get on with it. Now, um, that's a sneaky peek. You are the first people anywhere apart from Ula and Kyla and myself and the person that did this badge. But we have a brand new certified educator badge and a new certified educator course that's going to be coming out. And we recognize that this year has been really quite tough for everyone. And we thought carefully, we didn't want to just launch something when everyone was, you know, really uh, grappling with kind of changing practice. So we've delayed our launch and we want to get it right. So it sits with the new interface as well. But we'll be launching our brand new ThingLink Certified Educator, but the badge is ready. So there's the badge for you. We wanted you to have a sneaky peek of it today. But also we'll be launching a ThingLink Certified Trainer. There'll be an annual teacher challenge, which is a way to uh, keep up your ThingLink certified educator status. And the teacher challenge will be to have a go at creating a ThingLink and we'll do something that's in context. And because we recognize the work of our higher education colleagues, and as we mentioned before, TVET, um, which is the technical vocational education training that's used as a, a global term now with UNESCO, we thought it would be about time that we had an e-learning specialist. So we want there to be something for everybody. So these are the courses that you'll start to see being released, but we've been just being a bit mindful of the pressure that everyone's been under and we want to get our timing absolutely right. There you go, there's the badge. So that's kind of bringing us to a bit of a close now, but I'm gonna bring in all of our other Fantastic panel members, and I do believe we have someone joining us who is the one and only founder, creator, and CEO. If I can scroll down, where's Ula? There we go. Ula, welcome. You're on mute still. I think you're off. You're on mute. Yay! Welcome. You must be so Yay. proud of seeing That's these. Nice. Thank you so much. <laughs> this is this is a great webinar. I I love this and and um. And, uh, and of course, like Sarah, Sarah is one of my favorite users, like we met many years ago, and she was the one one of the first persons in higher education to actually start testing the virtual tours when we launched the editor. So really great to see your example today and all the other examples as well. 
And you know, so just a, a couple couple of thoughts for this Q and A. Um, when recently, when we talked about higher education, there's been a lot of really important topics on the table, and uh, like most most often, the first kind of incentive to to start thinking about new tools is how can how can I create more engaging material for my students, and maybe the second incentive is. Um, uh, you know, we, we need to now when, when a lot of the campuses are closed, we, we need to try to uh, somehow increase the flexibility and accessibility and, and, and come up with new ways of really like arranging, like rearranging uh, uh, the edu whole educational program. And so we see a lot of interesting examples there. But I got to say, like, also one topic that we haven't really talked a lot about, but that's what what's definitely and um, in my mind, a lot when we're building the the, the new features to ThingLink is is research, and especially like how can you support qualitative research? Because now when every everybody's under lockdown, it's it's really hard to go and do you know empirical observations. It's hard to go and do interventions. It's uh, hard to gather like mirroring data. Uh, so uh, so what what we're trying to to do is yes, as Luis mentioned, we are going to introduce. ThingLink forms, and that's our first step towards thinking how can we um, truly be uh, uh, kind of like um, build on the promise of smart visual media so that you could also use visual media to collect data, meaningful data for research. And, and I think that there is a lot of interesting opportunities out there. Um, and as I said, like some of the, uh, some of the applications first applications could be just like participant observation uh, we we are already seeing examples where 360 video is used um uh, to share some of the just like social um situations between colleagues and then to discuss about and take colleagues to different real world situations so that everybody can share understanding of the same context and and and, and i can um and i would really uh welcome any kind of pilot projects if anybody is interested in um, doing applied research or you know even some some uh, who has a longer research project on the use of multimedia in research or the use of um, uh, uh, this kind of interactive virtual tours in um, in in field research uh, we'd be we'd love to collaborate but yeah I think that there is a there is a really lot of lot of opportunity out there, and also I think it's new opportunity. It's it's not really necessarily replacing the field work that we would be doing without, uh, you know, in non-pandemic situation. But it can also mean that you can scale research in a whole new way, and then you can do international uh, collaboration in a much easier way than before. Wow, yeah, this must be just so fantastic for you to see that, you know, not only are the examples just getting richer and richer, but as you introduce the new features, that those features are enabling people to go that much further with them as well. And the research angle is just, yeah, uh, instant research. I mean, that's got to be just such a, a, a great feature for, for higher education. That's a great term, instant research, by the way, or an instant data collection, because normally it takes so much time. <laughs> yeah. Love this. yeah. Um, there's a few questions that are coming through, but lots of um, people just really showing a lot of love for everything they're seeing as well. Um, just a confirmation on the badge. So the educator badge, the certified educator, is for um, all educators. Um, and the reason we put the e-learning specialist in there is really quite orientated to work-based learning, but education um, obviously is for all education across all ages and stages. But what I really love is that, you know, Amanda's been on the webinar chat and she focuses on early years, but she's taken some really nice um, concepts and ideas. And, you know, I know that Abby and Sarah have been inspired as well by other thing links they've seen from, you know, other people working in education. So. We try and think about trainee teachers as well in higher education that are going to be using this for their students as well. And I guess we're all always learning. But in terms of the certified educator, yeah, that is for all ages and e-learning is more for work-based learning. Um, so if there's any other questions, 
um, please do pop them in the chat. We've just got a couple of minutes left, but um, I would just personally like to say a huge thank you to Abby and Sarah and Kyla for all of the work that they've done. Um, I just love these webinars because it's you guys that have you know, the opportunity to share all of the work that you're doing. Um, if anyone's watching and they want to share any examples with us, please go ahead and do get in touch um, with us. We'd like to gain more. Um, and just any sort of last thoughts from anybody? Does anybody have anything else they would like to add? I just wanted to point out there's been a couple of really quick questions I thought we could answer that have come through the chat. Um, Martin's asked, what dimensions are the images used for panning around? Um, so the answer to that really is um, any 360 images using a 360 camera, or you can use an app like Google Street View. It's a really simple way of producing it if you don't have a, a 360 camera. Um, and also Paula Shaw has asked, how accessible is this on mobile, et cetera, in developing countries? Very accessible. Yep. Yeah, totally mobile friendly. Um, Thinglink works Ooh. across all platforms and all devices. Ula, I want to add uh, the uh, when we we probably want to talk about offline the viewability and and that's definitely something we will be looking into next year. Uh, we have offline viewing option for desktop, but we we will need that for mobile as well. So that's that's definitely on our roadmap for next year. Well, that's it. That's our hour again. Thank you so much, everybody. It's just another really, really great webinar. Do feel free to share the link out. This will be available on our YouTube straight afterwards. And yeah, keep safe, everybody, and enjoy the rest of your evening. And we look forward to hearing from you all soon. So thank you from all of us here. <laughs>